test is that is working. Maybe so we can then right away start so that we don't lose time because we have plenty of presenters. Perfect. Okay. Right. Looks very well. Okay. Do you, do you want that, that I turn off? No, no, leave it because I think we will okay. start with you first, so. Okay. I don't know. Um, a very nice presentation in the, in the plenary, so maybe they are asking questions. I see, but um, I wait for instructions from the FAO colleagues what we should do. Yeah. Don't, don't One thing is sure, I will have to leave at four o'clock, so. <laughs> I think you can, yeah, I think we can start. She was uh, just uh, giving the instructions to access to the, to the parallel sessions. And I think it's finished now, so you can, you, you can start, please. Thank you very much. So thank you. May I welcome everybody to this uh, parallel session. I think um, we have um, a, a very dense program actually, and uh, we, we will address the theme number three of this conference, which is actually addressing soil biodiversity in shaping the future of food systems. Uh, I'm Luca Montanarella, by the way, I work for the European Commission and I'm in charge within the European Commission of uh, soil related activities. Uh, especially dealing with um, the European Soil Data Center and then the European Soil Information System and all the related activities. So, um, of course, uh, this is a very dense program. So I hope that we will manage to keep the time so that we uh, successfully complete the, the, the program. Um, we will have a first block of three presentations uh, from two to till three o'clock and then have a, a second block of four presentations um, from three till four o'clock. And I hope that the time will be enough uh, to allow also for questions and answers. Um, I will move the question and answers at the end of each block so that we can um, uh, interact with the speakers. Uh, and so uh, I think at this stage, um, uh, I, I think really I would like to welcome now the first speaker uh, which is uh, Mrs. Veronica Andrea El Moitar. Um, she comes from Argentina and she will uh, present to us uh, soil biodiversity management for food security. So, uh, Veronica, the floor is yours. Please. Thank you. Okay, so. Um... Uh, good morning uh, to everyone. In this presentation, I will talk about a review paper that we present, uh, published, sorry, with my colleagues in 2019. The main goals of this uh, article was to provide an overview of the relations between soil biodiversity, agricultural management, and food production, and to provide scientific evidences of the potential of soil biodiversity management to improve food security and nutrition. So we perform a systematic literature search combining four different search strategies, and then we organize and classify the articles according to our scientific research topics. Uh, first, I need to introduce uh, the framework that we use to organize all this information in the article. Uh, we uh, classify soil organisms according to three functional groups, chemical ecosystem, biological regulators, and ecosystem uh, engineers that are related mostly, but not exclusively, with nutrient cycling, biological dynamics, and soil structure. These uh, three functional groups can vary in different uh, soil compartments uh, according to environmental conditions. Uh, for example, um, the, the rhizosphere, the um, the tritosphere or the arabatosphere, and also with soil depth. Soil biodiversity depends on biotic factors such as plant and animal diversity, and on abiotic factors such as temperature and rainfall and edaphic traits. And also, as was mentioned yesterday in the presentations, uh, there is an important relation between above and below ground diversity. 
um, Solvaya Diversity Influence Ecosystem Services, and we focus mostly on food security. And um, Solvaya Diversity is influenced by different drivers. We focus mostly on land use change and soil management. So one of the main uh, result, results that we found is that we have a growing, a growing understanding and appreciation of soil biodiversity and its complexity. In this uh, picture, uh, we can see how the terms that we use to refer soil biodiversity change over time. In the beginning, we used terms such as uh, fauna and uh, microbes, and now we are using terms such as uh, diversity, communities, food webs, etc. However, 80% um, of soil biodiversity research came from Northern Hemisphere, and uh, therefore we have an important gap for uh, research in Southern Hemisphere. Considering our research topics, we found that most of the information was related with drivers of soil biodiversity and soil biodiversity and soil functions, but we also uh, found that uh, information of this paper indicates that there is a potential of soil biodiversity management to improve soil productivity, ecosystem services, and food security and nutrition. Considering the relation between soil organisms and plant productivity, we found that most of the information is related with bacteria and fungi, and therefore with chemical engineers and the soil process related with them. Uh, when Considering uh, land use management and, um, uh, sorry, land use change and uh, soil management, we found that uh, diversity and diversity mediated soil processes are negatively affected by land use change and intensive agriculture. This is just one of the reports that we found. But there are also uh, in, uh, positive uh, impacts on uh, diversity uh, by organic or agroecological farming. So, the information indicates that we can manage positively or negatively soil biodiversity. Um, one aspect of soil biodiversity that is highlighted in the recent uh, research is that uh, network interactions could be more important than richness and abundance. Um, yesterday in her presentation, Diane Wall mentioned network interactions and one would speak of network interactions would refer to the relation between different type of organisms in the soil that can be affected by the land use change and uh, soil management. So these three functional groups uh, of uh, soil organisms have direct and indirect impact on soil processes and through these soil processes with uh, and conserving soil biodiversity we can impact on ecosystem function and services and um, the food pillars of food security. Our research also revealed that there are uh, two main emerging approaches for soil biodiversity management, the reductionist approach and the holistic approach. In the reductionist approach, soil is considered mostly as a source uh, for taping genes and organisms that can be used or modified through biotechnology. Um, one of the um, main examples or the, 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 the main examples is the production of uh, biofertilizers based on chemical engineers. And uh, this approach is mostly based on chemical engineers, bacteria and fungi, and in particular with the impact of these organisms in plant soil biota kilogram interactions. Through these interactions, we can modify or increase ecosystem uh, provisioning system and also availability and nutrition and safety, uh, these two pillars of food security. On the other side, the holistic approach, uh, think uh, in the soil as a system and try to uh, conserve as mass as possible all soil processes. And to do this, we need to conserve the three groups uh, of functional soil organisms. And through these soil processes and their conservation, we can influence ecosystem services and food security. So just to present uh, to one example of each approach, the idea of the reductionist approach is that uh, if we have a degraded rhizosphere, we can use the knowledge that we have on the natural rhizosphere to uh, produce an engineer rhizosphere using carbon source and biofertilizers. 
the idea is that we try to improve uh, the rhizosphere by using uh, these uh, soil organisms. On the other side, in the holistic approach, we try to um, propose alternative uh, agricultural system between these two extremes, the extensive system and the intensive system. One example is the ecological intensification. Uh, the idea is to uh, pro pro propose a sustainable system in which we can uh, have high productivity and high soil biodiversity uh, using a moderate resource input, low nutrient losses, and uh, having high rate of regulatory processes because we are conserving soil processes and acting on soil processes. Uh, so ecological in intensification is just one example of uh, the implementation of holistic approach. Yesterday, uh, in the presentation of Philippe Parisi, uh, we, um, um, we observe another implementation of uh, this approach. And this is all. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. This was really very interesting. And uh, I was Thank particularly you. impressed by your literature review that shows this divide between North and South. Maybe we can come back to that. It's really very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, as Thank I said, you. we will have a question and answer session at the end of this block. So I give now the floor to the next presentation so that um, we can then uh, possibly uh, have enough time at the end of the block for a question and answer session. So our next speaker is again from uh, South America, from Brazil. It's uh, Mrs. Karina Gonzalez David, um, that I hope is with us. I hope so. Um, yes, welcome. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, she will present to us uh, uh, from soil to table agroforestry systems as an alternative to regenerative agriculture. Very promising title. Thanks a lot for presenting and the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Can I start? Yeah, please, please. Okay. And if you want to share your screen with your presentation, go ahead. Okay, one minute. You will sh show my screen or I do it? Uh, the previous speaker was showing it to herself, but uh, if you prefer, we can ask here our colleagues of FAO if they want to do it for you, as you want. Okay, I prefer. You prefer if they do it or you do it? They do it, please. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, then let me ask them if they can. Carolina, are you listening or Buffet? Yes, Bofei is going to do it. Bofei, do you have the presentation or do I just found yes. here my presentation. I can do that. Sorry. You're doing it? Okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah. Are you? We see your presentation now. Okay, good. <laughs> Please, Hello, go everybody. My name is Karina. I'm from Latin America. I'm an organic farmer. Me and my husband, we grow food in our land here in the south of Brazil. We are in the state of Paraná, in the city of Campo Largo. So in the same time we are farmer, we are regenerating nature through agroforestry system. I'm a member of Ecovida PGS and we are member of INOFO, that is the intercontinental network of the organic farmers organization. I'm thankful and very happy to be here in these spaces talking about our work here in agroforestry system. It's so difficult to have farmers on these spaces, so I'm representing these people and I'm very happy for that. I'm sorry for my English. <laughs> I'm not a scientific research or teacher, but I will do my best. <laughs> So agroforestry systems are an alternative for agricultural production, where agro refers to the act of farming the land, and forest refers to a system based on the principle of the forest. So 
we observe in nature and learn with this manifestation. Then we can reproduce that in lines. Agroforestry system can be practiced in whole world, in different regions and climates, as long as it respects and follow the logic of the forest, which uh, has general and specific characteristics. Um, our practical experience has shown that agroforestry system contributes to the recovery of the soil on several aspects. For example, discompression, erosion, humidity, increased diversity of meso and macrofauna, color, texture, and increasing production quality. Agroforest is not like a cake recipe. So the first step to have in mind uh, what is the goal of the farmer, what you can do, what you want to do, and then you can choose infinite kinds of plants. Once you have your objective, it can be planting vegetable, medicinal plants, mushroom, wood, fruits, etc. It's infinity. <laughs> You need to observe and understand how the nature works, the mechanism, the principle, the engine, how the nature survives and reproduce in harmony, and then reproduce it in a smart agriculture. So in agroforestry system, we have lots, lots of principles. I will talk about a uh, short of them. Uh, the first one is natural suction. Uh, is the dynamic process that refers to the time and the function of each plant in the system, where one plant creates condition for the others that keep coming. Of course, in this explanation is so basic and summarized. We can stay here days and one year talking about the principles these principles and the other one. Uh, another principle are stratification. These principles are complementary to the principle of succession in the space that is the space of the plants occupy in the timing, according to the need of sun and nutrients for their development. It's the forest floors in the nature. And it's always important to remind that agriculture is the art of harvest the sun and cover the sun energy in food. Uh, there are plants that need less sunlight, there are plants that need more sunlight. So nature do and teach it and us, we design it. The other principle are pruning. Pruning is the, is the engine of the system. In nature, it occurs through animals, rain, and all other mechanisms. We, as being belonging to this system and considerate large animals, also contribute with uh, the end of optimizing the system process. There are different types, types of uh, pruning, such as, such as fruiting, formation, and different kinds. All pruning seeks is to optimize life process. Unlike conventional agriculture, uh, which seeks to maximize, we optimize and we optimize the use of the soil. And the other principle uh, I think is the most important for this this day here and not for the, the agroforest is the soil cover. We never plant without that. Uh, when we enter in a forest that has grown naturally, we will never, never see the bare soil. Nature always has its mechanisms to keep the soil covered and protected. So why we didn't do that? <laughs> The soil cover has infinity benefits, such as thermal and water balance, uh, availability of nutrients for the plants and for all the biota. 
structuring for water and air infiltration, erosion protection, and many, many other benefits. Our teacher, Ana Primavera, is a Brazilian woman. I think everyone knows this special woman. She said a long time ago that a healthy plant is the result of a healthy soil. And another teacher, Ernest Goethe, teacher that a healthy plant is the result of a balanced system. So when we do agroforestry, we keep uh, approaching of this balance system. So here I will show some photos of our agroforest here in the farm. Uh, this is the way we design our system. We do two lines of trees and in the middle we plant vegetable or it can be uh, other plants that have short circles. Cir circles. Uh, we do that in the middle until the sunlight comes inside. Then the succession continues. I wrote here in my presentation the name and the objective of each species, but I have a, have not. I, I think I have no time to talk about each in this uh, in this space now. But I think the presentation will be available for everyone, and I will be available here if someone needs to talk more about that species. Uh, when we arrived here in this farm, uh, years ago, people did conventional agriculture, and we started this organic agriculture. We did a soil analysis and we found these numbers. The pH was 5.6. The micronutrients was so low, we couldn't see the insects in the soil. The aluminum had 26% uh, and the organic matter was only 20%. And what did we do? in this time. So I will talk about uh, the step-by-step -step of the preparation to start an agroforestry system. So first we prepare the soil with this small tractor, we call that in Portuguese tratorito, uh, to discompact the soil. And it's, it's important to remind that before uh, they practice uh, conventional agriculture. So we need to put some, some, in, uh, some fertilizer here in the soil and we use rock powder, manure, limestone and vegetable ash just to start because we didn't have a health soil. So we, we need some help. And then we delimit take the spaces where, where is the space of the bed? Where is the spaces to walk? Because we never walk in the bed lines, never. Uh, the better way to start the, the agroforestry system when we have big tree is to start implanting this big tree. So we start with this big tree and then we cover the soil. And then we start to plant the smaller species once we have the soil cover. Or we have the rain or we do the first irrigation. And then we, I show here to you the first harvest uh, before 20 days. We have the first vegetables that have the shortest circle. After 30 days, we still have some vegetables. Oh. After 55 days, we still harvesting vegetable. You can see the difference in how the plants are health. After 110 days, we start to harvest this kind of vegetables 
and it's more easy to see how the, the soil responds of this kind of agriculture. And after 150 days, we still have vegetables like potatoes, candy potatoes, manioc and other kinds of vegetables. So uh, after one year practicing this kind of agriculture, agroforestry system, uh, we, we can see the difference of the soil. Uh, we can see like lots of difference. The smell are different, the texture of the soil are different, the color are different. We can see lots of kinds of insects inside the soil. It's only before one year. And the health of the plants is the best to show the health of the soil. After one year, we did the, again the analysis, the soil analysis, and we found different numbers. The pH uh, increased and goes to 6.3. The micronutrients was so, so higher. The aluminum uh, is down for 17% and the organic matter 45%. This work I'm presenting here is about one year of work in this land, but we are here. There are more time, and I, I, I'm very happy to show the results of this kind of agriculture, agroforest system, before five, four years later. The first picture is when we arrived here and we cut the, the, the matter that had here to start agriculture here. And then you can see the other pictures uh, as before for years. It's so, so different. We can find the birds and lots of different animals bigger too. I think it's burning, I did. Okay, okay. So here, uh, the fruits and the harvest can talk more than me. Uh, we can see some fruits and some residues of this, this uh, agriculture. More than. And in summary, agroforest is the way to agriculture in harmony with nature. Or we do like nature teacher us, or we have a counting time in this planning. So thank you everybody for your attention. And I'm here available to talk more about this, this situation. Thanks a lot. This was very impressive and you can already read from the comments on the chat that uh, there were plenty of colleagues online that have been enthusiastic about what you presented, which is quite impressive. Please stay with us uh, at, um, till the end of this first block of presentations because we will have a question and answer session at the end of the next presentation so that we can then have maybe further discussions on what you presented, which was very interesting. Um, I think uh, we, we should move right away to the final presentation of this first block of theme three, Soil Biodiversity Shaping the Future of Food Systems. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, the next speaker, which uh, she the comes from my own country, so from Italy, Miss Anna Rosa Sprocati from Enea Casace in Italy. And she will present to us uh, enabling barley production in arid soils by only exploiting the indigenous microbial biodiversity. So, Anna Rosa, if you are online, please, uh, the floor is yours. Yes, I'm online. Do you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so, okay. please share your presentation, or if you prefer, oh. maybe colleagues of FAO can do it for you. I don't know. No, I have uh, the presentation. Just a moment. I should be ready. Okay. But, okay. Um, can you can you see? Not yet, but uh, 
keep trying. Okay. Maybe this one. Okay, now it's coming. Okay. Okay. Very well. Yes, please go ahead. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I'm trying to show you a, um, uh, a, a trial to enabling body uh, production in arid soils by only exploiting the indigenous microbial biodiversity. And uh, I present uh, uh, on behalf of uh, all consortium or co-author you listed here. And uh, uh, the work uh, is uh, um, part uh, of a project, Airnet Met 2 Project Supreme, uh, that uh, has the objective to um, combat impoverishment of soils and to reduce the use of fertilizers and waters, harnessing the spontaneous uh, microbiome potential to improve plant growth functions in soil. So it's an adaptive approach uh, respect to the um, uh, the presentation of uh, a holistic approach, but uh, it works in, uh, in some, uh, some way. Uh, the, this project uh, addresses local communities uh, distrib distributed over four uh, Mediterranean countries, uh, that are um, Sardinia, Italy, uh, Algeria, uh, Cyprus, uh, and uh, Jordan. Uh, this uh, country has been increasingly challenged by water scarcity and by low agricultural productivity due to the scarce uh, biogeochemical function of soils. I'm uh, presenting uh, um, the work carried out uh, with the soil, uh, semi arid soil uh, of the agronomic station of Algrail Agricultural Station in Jordan. And uh, where they, um, they grow cereals uh, and especially barley. The work plan uh, was uh, envisaged uh, to characterize uh, the soil. Uh, for the microbiological aspect. So after soil sampling, uh, we uh, extract the microbial community and then uh, study um, the community uh, by ecoplates biologue to, um, uh, to observe the physiological profile at community level. And then uh, we cultivate, isolate the cultivable strain uh, and uh, we focus on bacteria. And so we cultivate the bacteria on three different uh, media, nitrogen free nutrient uh, and mineral medium to enhance uh, the possibility to isolate the strains. Then all the strains were uh, identified by uh, the sequence of RDNA16S and characterized for plant growth promotion um, functions features. Then the best, uh, the more uh, suitable um, strains have been selected to uh, uh, develop a microbial formula uh, to be used as a bio-augmentation agent in pot experiments that were preliminary to the field trial. Uh, now underway in Jordan. So the soil was, of course, uh, a, a good uh, agricultural soil, but uh, uh, in uh, semi-arid conditions. So um, with a good microbial load, uh, with a good, uh, quite good uh, fu uh, functional biodiversity, and uh, uh, we isolate uh, 42 colony morphotypes uh, that were distributed in uh, main five uh, phylogenetic classes uh, with prevalence of gamma proteobacteria and actinobacteria. The, uh, the plan of promoting functions uh, um, 
um, where uh, um, a prevalence of nitrogen fixing, uh, while the phytohormone production were the, uh, the least represented function. So this is the phylo phylogenetic tree of the, our isolates. And uh, all the strains uh, are now uh, um, from uh, Jordan, but also from the other experimental sites uh, in uh, the project, are collected uh, in uh, the collection, our collection, Enea MIRI, that uh, participated to the European MIRI network for the safeguard of microbial biodiversity. So um, we selected the, the uh, the strain for the microbial formula uh, based on two main uh, um, criteria. One, that the formula has to um, uh, include all uh, the uh, um, plan growth promoting function. And the second one, uh, that uh, have to uh, re reflect the structure of the microbial community in order to um, enhance uh, the uh, functions without uh, perturb perturbing too much uh, the uh, my uh, microbiological system uh, spontaneous. So uh, this is the microbial formula that uh, include uh, all the uh, PGB functions. And uh, we use this formula in two different uh, experiments, uh, pot experiments, uh, one at NEA in Italy and the second one at the uh, Muta University in Jordan. Uh, so uh, the bioaugmentation uh, uh, was performed with our formula and uh, both experiments uh, uh, had uh, envisaged three different treatments, the control, just water, uh, chemical fertilizers uh, and the bacteria. In the first experiment, uh, we um, tested two water levels uh, and optimal levels calculated on the water retention capacity of the soil and uh, a water stress, uh, one fourth of the optimal one. In the second experiment, uh, uh, we tested the three different uh, uh, water levels. So optimal, middle and stress. The first experiment was carried out, lasted 20 days, room temperature, 70% of humidity, and the light dark cycle of 14, 10 hours. Here we can see some images in, in the presence of optimal water uh, after 20 days uh, during the tillering phase of the barley. Uh, there are no appreciable uh, differences between uh, the uh, conditions. While uh, in, under water stress, uh, only the um, bio augmentation uh, could sustain the growth of uh, the plantlets. That's uh, in agreement with the physiological profile uh, that we can see uh, only where bioaugmentation was performed, both the optimal water or uh, water stress, uh, the metabolic activity of the soils was uh, uh, increased, and also the functional bio, um, the functional diversity of the soil was maintained. Uh, in the presence of bacteria under water stress. Uh, also, the plant physiological parameters confirm uh, uh, the results uh, in the presence for fresh weight of aerial parts and root system. In uh, optimal condition, water condition, there were no uh, appreciable differences statistically, I mean. Uh, but uh, in uh, uh, under water stress, uh, the only condition able to sustain the growth was uh, in the presence of bacteria. The same uh, uh, for root system, uh, but uh, not under uh, water stress. 
For the root system, uh, we uh, analyzed the average number of uh, adventitious roots, uh, roots uh, the lateral roots, uh, and the length of uh, uh, adventitious roots. And uh, also here, we can notice that uh, in presence of optimal water, no big differences, but difference under water stress. The same for lateral uh, roots, while the length of uh, adventitious roots uh, will uh, decrease in the presence of bioaugmentation. Maybe because uh, the bacteria, uh, it, it was evident uh, looking at the ground, at the soil, have the capacity to retain water and uh, the roots uh, uh, need less uh, to, to go to explore for water. The second experiment, uh, quite the same uh, conditions, uh, has, uh, lasted uh, uh, eight uh, weeks. And uh, uh, the, the colleagues uh, of the Muta uh, University, Professor Tayel, uh, um, observed uh, the biomass, uh, stem length, uh, number of roots, uh, and length of roots. And uh, we can see that uh, uh, for any uh, parameters, uh, the best uh, um, results were done by, the, uh, by bacteria, the presence of bacteria by augmentation, especially under water stress. That uh, is the um, yellow bar here. And that's uh, some picture. And uh, in the presence of water stress, so we can see the big difference between uh, or the control, uh, chemical fertilizers, and bacteria. So, in summary, uh, we, um, we establish a tailor made microbial formula uh, and use this alternative to chemical fertilizer for supporting the growth of barley in the semi-arid soil uh, in Jordan. The formula is composed by 16 autochthonous performing PGP strains uh, selected to reflect as closely as possible the structure of the na native bacterial community. The formula was tested uh, uh, as agent of functional bioorientation to enhance uh, the function of soil under water stress. And uh, in conclusion, uh, we can say that uh, uh, when optimal water was supplied, uh, no major differences are, are observed. Thus, uh, bacteria can replace chemical fertilizers in this case. And uh, under water stress, uh, the bacteria formula proved to be the only treatment uh, enabling survival and healthy of barley plantlets. So uh, we think that a knowledge-based biogumentation technique could be the key to develop new approaches to the recovery of degraded soils, saving water, replacing chemicals, preserving and enhancing the indigenous microbial uh, biodiversity. On this basis, a two-year uh, field trial is underway at the Agbear station. Uh, for the first year, we had uh, very positive results, but uh, um, uh, the colleagues want to confirm the second cycle uh, for the crop before, um, uh, before um, producing the results publicly. So uh, I thank you very much for your attention uh, on behalf of Supreme um, Consortium. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Anna Rosa, for this very interesting presentation and uh, for the interesting collaboration across the Mediterranean, which is, of course, quite good news. Um, as you know, we have now completed the first block of three presentations for this afternoon parallel session. So we have now some time, if you want, and if you have questions, to directly put them to the presenters, if you want, by raising your hand or by uh, putting them on the chat uh, in writing. Um, both, both, uh, both modes of operation are possible. There are already several uh, questions actually on the chat, so I will start from them and then see if anything else comes in, also uh, of colleagues who want to take the floor. 
So let me first start with some questions that I see for Karina. Karina, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. So you, your presentation was uh, triggering quite a lot of interest, as you can read uh, in the chat. So uh, first question was, what was the criterion for choosing the tree species? So the criteria, it depends of the goals of this farmer. Uh, the objective, it can be wood, it can be medicinal plants for having essential oils, it can be plants that have the fibra, fibra for, fiber. for clothes, it can be, what do you want? It's, it's infinity possibilities, so it depends the, the goals, the objective. Okay, second question that you can see is what is the system of agroforestry called? Does it have a name? Yeah, the name is agroforestry system or syntropic farming. Okay, syntropic. Um, and another question comes in, where do you sell your products? <laughs> we sell that in a street market. Uh, and now with pandemic time, we started to to do delivery. So we sell directly in the houses uh, with our car. And uh, do you allow me myself a question? <laughs> because uh, I know a little bit of agroforestry and one of the biggest challenges if you want to adopt agroforestry is mechanization. You showed a little tool that you're using, but uh, you know, one of the biggest hurdles for agroforestry is that usually you must have a very labor intensive type of agricultural system, which of course is, for, at least for us here in Europe, meaning a very high cost and so pretty uncompetitive prices of what you want to bring to the market. So can you tell us how you address the issue of the difficulty of mechanization? Do you have a very intensive labor force that you must apply to, to do all this? Yeah, that's a big challenge. We have no technology for agroforestry system. Ernest Goethe started a, a research in this subject in Europe uh, to develop the, this, this technology, but it's not still available for us. Uh, so, but one, one one point is agroforest had the demands lots of work in the beginning, but once we are going in the years, uh, this work uh, is less because the nature is more in harmony. So we don't need to to intervention uh, like in the beginning but it's a big, big challenge to us technology. We are waiting for these this machines and these students and research to help us with this kind of agriculture. Okay, thanks a lot and good luck with your work, really impressive. I will move on, there are plenty of other questions here in the chat. So um, thank you for you very much for your presentation. Oh, well, no, sorry, first. Was the bacterial inoculum wild or native to Jordan? I imagine this is for Ana Rosa. So you want to reply? Uh, what? Uh, was the bacterial inoculum wild or native to Jordan soils? No, native from the same soil of the, the Agrippaia station. So we, we studied the population, the uh, microbial community, and uh, we just uh, uh, enhance the function we want, uh, the spontaneous uh, function that already are present in the soil. So we tried uh, this approach, uh, we call uh, functional bioaugmentation because we want to, uh, to improve the um, function of soil, uh, the uh, target function, in this case, uh, plant growth promotion. Uh, we, we also work on bioremediation and uh, also in this case uh, we want, uh, for instance, um, high, uh, hydrocarbon degraders. So we look for the function we need 
we select uh, the uh, spontaneous uh, bacteria or fungi, and uh, we enhance uh, this function. We uh, bio augment uh, the concentration of this uh, group, uh, trying to respect the structure of the community. Okay, I hope this was clear for the person who has been putting the question. Uh, next question was, um, did you publish this work? To you, Anna Rosa, I suppose. This is? The question is, thank you very much for your presentation. Have you published already this work that you are No, no, no not yet. Okay. <laughs> um, I see another question for Karina. How heavy are the operating activities for a five years old agroforestry system? Uh, it depends what you consider it heavy, but it's kind of it's, it's there demands lots of work. Uh, but how I say it, the work in the years is less than less because when the succession happened, we started to collect fruits and yerba mate and the other other plant, plants to have the essential oil. So in the beginning we we need lots of heavy work because it's smaller works but in the time passing the the it works uh it's less this work is less okay thanks a lot i see another question for you anna rosa thank you for your presentation i want to know how do you prepare the bacteria to use as inoculant yes. you isolate the bacteria from your own soil from uh, the soil uh, where we want to, to, to grow uh, crops. So we uh, prepare sepa sepa uh, individually the strains. We grow the strains in laboratory and uh, until, until the um, uh, plateau phase, the best uh, physiological conditions, then uh, we uh, separate from the growth medium. At the end, uh, we pull together the different strains. In this case, uh, we have uh, 16 strains. Uh, we pull together the strains. Uh, we dilute uh, to have uh, a concentration of uh, 10 to 7 uh, on the soil. Just uh, we pull together with, just with water. It's very, very simple. If uh, we have uh, the possibility to grow strains and do I mean, that uh, is very simple because we try to do in the simplest ways as possible. Okay, thank you. I see many questions coming in. I just want to remind at three o'clock we will to stop this because we need to move to the second block. But I see here another question. Um, uh, for also for you, Anna Rosa, what is the way moving forward to scale this up? Oh, they are already moved to the scale up because in Jordan they are uh, they they produce a lot of bacteria in fermenters and at the university, and they are now a, tri a field trial is active a field trial. So with the, uh, a real scale uh, production of barley. And that, that's uh, already the second year of um, field trial. We'll have, uh, I hope uh, at the end of this uh, season, the results of two years to, 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 to show you, to publish, uh, to share with you. Okay. Um, I don't know which one to take now. There are several other questions. Uh, well, one from Julio, what are the limits of adaptation of bacterials in terms of pH and aluminum saturation for tropical soils? Um, I suppose this is for okay. Karina, but uh, it's not specifying to whom, but... Okay, no, for us it's not so, because uh, we select directly from the soil, is the native uh, population, is the native community. So they are already adapted to this, this soil. So any pH uh, 
because uh, the principle is uh, to try to exploit the spontaneous uh, biodiversity you have uh, there. Microorganisms and bacteria are ubiquitous. You find any kind of bacteria uh, everywhere. The important is to, um, uh, to reinforce, to enhance their potential inside the community. Okay. So, for instance, uh, we found uh, we, we found uh, plant growth promoting bacteria uh, in uh, a mining sites. So, in it, it was not uh, a soil; it was uh, a waste of mining sites, uh, and uh, we found uh, there bacteria able to grow uh, to, and uh, we made uh, a phyto remediation, assisted phytoremediation for the control for the heavy metals. So you find bacteria, oh, you, find. you have to know them and to collect them and to help them uh, to come back in the soil. Okay, thanks a lot. I think we have plenty of other questions, but I just wanted to put one question from my side to Veronica, since she didn't get any question from the chat here. So uh, I was very intrigued by your statement that there is such a divide between the north and south of um, research publications that you have been reviewing. Do you have any idea why this is um, happening? Um, I think that first because we are um, developing countries and we have now uh, so many um, money to perform studies so we are more limited to publish and uh, also because i use or we use a scopus database and we choose information in english uh, only and maybe there are a lot of information in spanish that we not uh, review and um, now we are actually performing um, a revision in our country to see uh, the level of information that we have uh, in terms of uh, specifically soil biological indicators. But uh, I think that this is a pattern that we can observe in all the reviews uh, around the world in any subject. So most of the information came from Northern Hemisphere. But in terms of soil biodiversity, it's important because uh, different hemispheres have different patterns of um, um, plant biodiversity and animal biodiversity, climate change and different patterns are respected. So we need to have information uh, from different uh, hemisphere and different countries to um, propose uh, alternative for agriculture. Absolutely. I hope this conference will help. So I think we had an opportunity to voice our concerns. And again, thanks to all of you, all three of you, of course, for having participated in this first block of this session. And thanks for the participants and the people who put questions. I'm sorry if we cannot address all of them, but please, uh, maybe you can read them and directly reply over the chat to the colleagues who have been putting questions to you. By the yeah. way, I learned that uh, the presentations will be put online, so uh, people will have the possibility to go back to your presentations in case they didn't completely get some of the points you were making. And again, congratulations to all of you uh, for, for the excellent work. I, I would propose now that we slowly move to the second block that will start now until four o'clock. Uh, we will have the um, four additional presentations, um, starting with uh, Mrs. Christina Lascano from the University of California Davis in USA. I don't know if uh, Christina is already with us. Yes, I'm here. Okay, welcome. Uh, so um, I don't know if you want to uh, share your presentation from your computer or... Yes, I will do that. Yeah, please go ahead. All right. Okay, perfect. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and good morning from California, where I'm speaking today. 
I would like to thank the FAO and the organizers of the symposium for inviting me and for making this virtual meeting possible. My name is Christina Lafcano. I am I'm an assistant professor of soil ecology at the University of California, Davis. And today I'm going to be talking about a case study where we evaluated the importance of rhizosphere ecological interactions and specifically interactions with, between plants and microorganisms um, for improving plant health and supporting nutrition of strawberry plants under low production, uh, product, low, low production systems. So we know that there's more and more evidence of the important role of below ground ecological interactions for uh, supporting ecosystem processes and therefore directly affecting the health of soils, plants, and the environment. And so in that way, ecological interactions have a direct and indirect benefits for human health. And this is a bit of like the questions and the connections that I am investigating in my research program. But for today's presentation, I'm going to be focusing on the connections between below ground ecological interactions, precisely between plants and microbes and the relevance for plant health. So one of the areas of soil where these ecological interactions are the most important and the most relevant for plant health, it's the rhizosphere. And uh, the rhizosphere, as we all know, it's a, a tiny layer of soil around the plant roots where uh, plants secrete uh, exudates that attract microorganisms. And those microbes help plants cope with uh, diseases and support plant health by uh, mobilizing nutrients. So because of that, the rhizosphere has been compared to the human gut um, because of the important role of in, in plant health. Um, but the role of, of the rhizosphere uh, in plant health and nutrition has been traditionally disregarded in, uh, in agricultural production. And in order to take advantage of these interactions, we first need to understand the relevance and the drivers of these interactions. So the role of rhizosphere interactions could be particularly beneficial in those crops that require really large inputs of agrochemicals, such as strawberries. The strawberry industry has relied typically in the use of heavy applications of pesticides like methyl bromide to fight soil-borne diseases that decrease productivity. And the thing is that methyl bromide has been phased out uh, and the industry needs alternatives to these strong fumigants. At present, the industry is really interested in these, and there are several commercial and experimental strawberry cultivars that are known to be resistant to soil-borne pathogens. But the mechanisms behind this resistance is not, are not well understood yet. And it's possible that the rhizosphere microbiome has something to do with it. So the questions in this study were, first of all, to assess whether there is a distinctive rhizosphere microbial community, community in, rice, in strawberry plants. Second, whether breeding has affected this rhizosphere microbial community. And if so, what is the relevance for uh, plant health and nutrition in this crop? So to answer these questions, we carried out uh, two field trials that were parallel and synchronous uh, to test the resistance of 90 different cultivars of strawberries from the six main breeding programs that are being used around the world to two yeah. soil-borne pathogens Verticillium dahlia, which was naturally present in the experimental soils, and Macrophemina fasciolina, which had to be inoculated. Christina. We planted these cultivars in plots that contained 20 plants of each cultivar. And then the plots were arranged in the field following a randomized block design with four blocks, so four replicates. At Sorry, the end of the trial, that was uh, harvest time around July, we selected out of the 90 cultivars, we selected 10 that showed a range of resistance from very high resistance to very low or very high susceptibility to the pathogens. And in each of these 10 cultivars, we gathered samples of the rhizosphere and the bulk soil that we subjected to 16S RNA uh, high throughput sequences to, to assess the prokaryotic diversity. And we collected also samples of uh, the shoots 
to assess above ground traits, such as biomass and nutrient content in the leaves. So I'll show you some of the results of this experiment. And I'll start talking about the first question, whether strawberry plants have distinctive rhizosphere microbiomes. Do you hear me? So you can see. Sorry, yes? if I interrupt you. Sorry if I interrupt you, but people are asking if you could put your presentation in full screen because they don't see it well. Sorry for interrupting you. Okay, sorry. No, it's just that they, okay, now uh, maybe you can put the presentation mode. Sorry if I interrupt you. Oh, I didn't know it wasn't working. Is it working now? Uh, we see all your notes and all your other oh, stuff. Oh, okay. Maybe you should put it in presentation mode. Sorry if I interrupt you. <laughs> no worries. Uh, yes, and it should be in presentation mode, but now. Now it's perfect, thanks. Okay. <laughs> All right, no worries. Um, let me see. I, so I'm going to talk about the results of this trial. And so I'll start showing you the, um, the I'm going to start talking about the first question, which is whether a strawberry plants have a distinctive rhizosphere microbiome. So here in this graph, you can show, you can see the, the better diversity of bulk soils um, represented in with full circles and rhizosphere soils represented with open circles in the plants that were grown in the V. daily field trial in red and the Macrophomina fasolina trial in blue. So as you can see, the, uh, rhizos the, the microbial community of the bulk soils were significantly different between the two trials. But also within each trial, rhizosphere and bulk soils were um, significantly different as well. We look then at the alpha diversity uh, and the differences between bulk and rhizosphere soils, and we saw that they were different in each trial. So, but the trends were different depending on the trial. For instance, uh, in the case of the Macrophomina trial, the rhizosphere microbial community have, had a lower alpha diversity than the bulk soil, and the opposite trend was observed in the V daily trial, where the uh, alpha diversity was actually high, was um, higher in the rhizosphere. So what this is showing is that, in fact, the strawberry plants had a really exerted a really strong environmental filter in selecting uh, mi microorganisms to the rhizosphere, which uh, and this effect was consistent across the fields, but the identity of the specific microbes selected was very much dependent on the initial um, bulk microbiome available uh, for the plants to select. We looked a bit more closely to the relative abundance of different um, prokaryotic phyla in the rhizosphere and the bulk soil. And we saw that for the plants grown in the presence of B. dahlia, the rhizosphere soil had significantly higher amounts of verrucomicrobia, bacteroidetes, and proteobacteria. In the case of the Macrophomina fasolina trial, then uh, the same uh, phyla were more abundant in the rhizosphere, but also we found that actinobacteria was significantly higher as well. We looked specifically at the abundance of certain uh, bacterial taxa that are known to be beneficial for plant growth because they increase nutrient uptake or they are fungal antagonists. And so you can see here in green represented the abundance of these uh, taxa in the rhizosphere and in, in red in the bulk soil of the, in the two trials, the breed dahlia and the Macrophomina fasolina. And so you can see that the number of these beneficial taxa was higher in the rhizosphere uh, of the plants in the two trials. And that included uh, genera such as Pseudomonas, Arthrobacter, or Rhizobium, uh, which are known to be very beneficial uh, microorganisms. The second question was whether breeding affected the rhizosphere microbial community. So we compared the diversity in the rhizosphere between the different cultivars, as you can see here, uh, represented with the different colors. What we saw is that for the two trials, the cultivars had significantly different uh, rhizosphere microbial community. 
And in addition to that, we use uh, uh, distance-based redundancy analysis to correlate this rhizosphere microbiome with above ground traits, such as uh, the biomass of the plants, the mortality and the nutrient contents in the leaves. And we saw that there was a significant correlation between the microbiome and the rhizosphere and the biomass of the plants. And in addition, in the case of the plants grown in the presence of bee dahlia, there was a correlation with nutrient contents in the leaves and specifically magnesium content. And so the last question was, all right, and so what's the relevance of these for plant health and resistance to the two fungal pathogens. So we compare the rhizosphere of the plants which had different resistance. And so in, you have represented here uh, in, in this NMDS plot, plants that had moderate resistance in yellow, susceptible plants with low resistance in red and resistant plants in green. And uh, squares represent plants grown in the B. Delia trial. Circles represent plants grown in the Macrofumina trial. So we did find significant differences in the rhizosphere microbiome of the three resistant groups, especially in the case of B. Delia. In the case of Macrofumina fasciolina, it was only between the high and the low resistance that we found differences. These differences were accompanied by higher abundances of certain beneficial microorganisms in the rhizosphere resistant plants. Those were um, Burkordelia and Nocardioids in the case of plants that grown, were grown in, in the presence of B. dahlia. So plants that were resistant to Verticillium dahlia had higher abundance of these two bacterial genera. And in the case of plants resistant to Macrofumina fasolina, these plants have higher abundances of Nonomuraina and Artrobacter. So overall, um, strawberry plants showed to have a distinctive rhizosphere microbiome, which was enriched in beneficial bacteria. The structure of this microbiome was highly cultivar dependent and associated with plant biomass, nutrient uptake and resistance to soil for fungal pathogens. And the resistance was associated with a higher abundance of specific bio, very well-known biocontrol microorganisms. So all in all, uh, this shows that the selection of rhizosphere microorganisms could be a genetic trait that could be targeted through breeding to reduce the input of agrochemicals in this type of crop. Um, but the role of environmental conditions and soil health in driving the presence of beneficial microorganisms should be investigated first. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions uh, later during our Q&A session. Thank you very much. Great, great. Thanks a lot, Christina. And, and sorry again for having interrupted you. Uh, no worries. Thank you for letting uh, me know. It was very interesting also to learn how we can improve uh, strawberry uh, production with less environmental impact. So I'm looking forward then to the question and answers. Uh, I remind again everybody that uh, we will have a Q&A, a question and answer session after the end of the four presentations that we have on the program today. And we plan to close uh, at four o'clock uh, our time here in Europe, uh, so 16 hours Central European time this session. So um, I hope we will have some time left for doing all this. I move on so quickly to the next presentation, which is from uh, Nigeria, from our colleague Anthony Ozermaman Uzoma from Minna in Nigeria, who will present to us symbiotic relationship and effectiveness of soybean rhizopia in soils of the Nigerian savanna. Anthony, are you with us? Luca, we have been uh, searching for, for him, but uh, it seems that he is not here yet. We can perhaps continue with the next presentation. Okay, so while Anthony gets online, we will move on to the next presentation, which is from Mrs. Johanna Aguilar Cuba from the University Nacional Agraria La Molina in Lima, Peru. Um, uh, Joanna will present to us exploring the potential of tree rhizobium strains from Peruvian soils as biofertilizers for the common bean, Phaseolus vulgaris. Joanna, you are here? 
Hello. Yeah. Oh, hello. Yeah. yeah, perfect. I see your presentation. So the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, good morning. My name is Johanna Aguilar. I work at the um, Microbial Ecology and Biotechnology Laboratory of the Universidad Agraria La Molina in Lima, Peru. Um, I will present the study exploring the potential of three rhizobium strain from Peruvian soils as biofertilizer for the common being. The common being is the most important legume in Latin America, an important source of protein, calories, vitamins, and mineral such as iron for human consumption. Um, beans present a symbiotic association with the bacteria called rhizobium. This contribute to the biological fixations of nitrogen. Uh, take the molecular nitrogen found in the environment and convert it in ammonium, which is in, um, assimilable for the for plant. Bacteria will grow in gem medium supplemented with the L-tryptophan, which is an amino acid precursor of uh, IAA. An aliquot was uh, removed and centrifuge. Tsiolkovsky's research was um, added to. Where the readers uh, chef uh, code visualis and quantified in a spectrophotometer. For the calcium phosphate solubilization assays, bacteria were grow in gem broth and inoculated to MBRIP medium plates. The plates were incubated at uh, 28 degrees Celsius for 50 days. And the diameter of the solubilization halos was measured. Badas were carried at, with uh, three reputations Rhizobia strains. To obtain the identity of the strains under study, the DNA of the bacteria was first extracted using an extraction kit. Subsequently, to conserve it, uh, genes were amplified uh, with PCR, recreate, and glint to. The sequences of the amplified was were aligned with the types strain of rhizobia recovered from the GenBack database. So evaluate the effect of the symbiosis in common being variety Canario Centenario. Uh, these seeds were pre-germinated with 17% uh, alcohol and 3% sodium hypochlorite. The inoculation with the um, with one milliliter of bacterial brought per seed. Uh, this was uh, installed in pots with vermiculate substrate and seeds, all under sterile conditions. The experiment was conducted uh, in a ground cham chamber at 20 or 25 degrees Celsius. This work used um, completely randomized experimental uh, design with their uh, three repl replicates per treatment this year. Results and discussions. Um, phylogenetic um, um, analysis uh, using the sequences of two housekeeping genes confirmed that they were in that rhizobium strain and revealed that uh, each strain belonged to uh, different rhizobial species. The 20C strain called Biasa to the Rhizobium tropici species. Safety C uh, to the Rhizobium netly species um, and the um, A6 uh, strain to Rhizobium sophori radishes. Um, IAA productions was uh, detected in the three Rhizobial strains. Uh, figure one uh, showed that or the a thing that uh, indicates the existence of a, a indole acetic acid. Phosphate solubilization was uh, observed uh, only for strain 30C and uh, 20C. Figure um, 2 show the formation of solubilization halos. 
The sodium inoculation was evaluated at 56 days. All the inoculated treatments show the same or the better responses in the parameter of fresh and dry weight that the non-inoculated control treatment that receive chemical nitrogen. The resolvium tropici strain induces the highest dry weight of shoots and nodules. While the combination of resolvium netli and resolvium saporiradicis have the best results for the weight of the fresh and dry parts. The dry weight of the nodules was um, better for resolvium tropici, while the interaction of resolvium etli and resolvium saporiradicis uh, was the one with the lowest weight. This indicates that a great, greater a number of nodules will not necessarily uh, give a great nitrogen fixation efficiency. This will depend on several factors, including the efficacy of the bacterial strain. The most efficient stage in the plain gestobium interactions. And um, in the treatments where consortia are used, uh, the fixing capacity of the strain when uh, they are in combination is important. In this slide, we will see that there is a good relationship with, between the chlorophyll content and the results of the which of the path. Uh, the me measurement of the chlorophyll content but path indices was carried out using a chlorophyllometer. This gives us an indirect a measure of the nitrogen content. Um, the combined treatment of resolvium ethylene and resolvium saporiradicis um, presented the best uh, values at uh, 36 and 56 days, thus uh, showing a, a good correspondence between a high width of the path and a better and constant constant uh, increase in the chlorophyll content with time. The chlorophyll content in plants uh, inoculated with resolvium tropici increasing to the 45, but the decrease. This may explain its uh, better performance in weights of uh, shoes versus pack. Conclusions. Three species of the bacterial genus Resovium able to nodulate uh, the common being were found in Peruvian soils. Um, although the strain were able to promote the growth of being, a combination of the species Resovium etli and Resovium saporiradicis uh, stands out in chlorophyll content and pad gel. More studies are recommended to this, uh, the Resovial uh, strains under fair conditions. Um, this work could be developed thanks uh, to Fondesit from the Fondo Nacional de Desarrollo Científico, Tecnológico y de Innovación Tecnológica in Peru, and uh, to the BRI uh, from Universidad Agraria La Molina, Lima, Peru. Um, Finally, I would like to say that you said your comments or questions to my email uh, and it will be answered with pleasure. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Joanna, for this very interesting presentation. And concerning questions, yes, uh, of course, people can write to you, but we will have hopefully some time at the end of this uh, series of presentations, uh, some time for questions and answers. And please stay with us. Um, till the end of this session so that eventual questions can be forwarded to you. Um, I, I don't know if meanwhile uh, we have been able to have our colleague from Nigeria, Anthony Zoma, with us. Anthony, are you with us? Um, I don't see any. No? Uh, well, 
I would suggest that um, in the hope that Anthony will connect sooner or later, that we move on then to the next presentation, which is um, from our colleague from Morocco, Mr. Mohamed Maldani. Yes, yes, I'm here. You hear me? Great to have you with us. Yes, uh, um, he will present to us influence of soil type on the biodegradation of pesticides by rhizobacteria, the case of glyphosate and paraquat. So, yes. uh, challenging title. Uh, I hope that you yeah. can share yeah. your presentation or you would prefer. Yes, to... yes I share it. Okay, thanks a lot. The floor okay. is Okay, it's clear. Ahead. It's clear. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, uh, I would uh, like to thank the organizing committee for the great work already accomplished for the success of this symposium. I also would to thank the scientific committee and all the participants, professors, experts, and students. I'm Mohamed Mildani from Morocco. I'm from University of Ismail. I'm here uh, now in Italy for Erasmus program. I'm here today to present part of my research work and it led influence of soil type on biodegradation of pesticide, bacteria. A case of two pesticides, very famous pesticide in all the world, glyphosate and paraquat. So, in the, in the first part, you will give a general idea of the problematic about the problematic and of the objective of this study. Then in the second part, you will explain the methodology and the result obtained. And the final, I will give uh, to I go I will go to, to to conclude and give some perspectives. So let's start. What the, why uh, the soil very important for us? Soil is our life support system. Soil provide anchorage for roots and uh, hold water and nutrients and home of myriad microorganisms that fix nitrogen and decompose organic matter and armies of microscope animals as well, earthworms. So what the relationship between the, the soil and our problem? According to, uh, to the United Nations report in uh, 2016, the world population except to reach 9.7 billion by 2015. The inner, this innermost demographic growth is one of the causes of intensive agriculture, which lead to the, the, the increase of chemical inputs such as pesticide. So increased use of pesticides automatically increase problem and pollution. And the soil is one of the most affected components by this pollution. When we talk about soil pollution, we automatically talk about the influence of this problem and this uh, pollution on the soil components. So are, are there solutions to eliminate this problem? In fact, yes, the bioremediation or biodegradation of pesticide by microorganism is one of the solutions. So let's, we have uh, the objective of our study was to evaluate the influence of soil type on the degradation of two pesticides, glyphosate and, par and paraquat by using the bacteria, uh, by using the basic soil respiration method that we assisted to ability of the four nitrogen fixing bacteria to biodegradation of glyphosate and paraquat, as well the influence of soil type. We, we have chosen four nitrogen fixing bacteria. The first one, Pontoy agglomerans, Rhizobium nipotum, Rhizobium radiobacter, Rhizobium chibiticum, and four type of soil, uh, dirty soils, Thersiatic, Calcimanesic, and Isoimic, sampled from, the, uh, from Morocco in Meknes City, and two mass herbicide, famous herbicide used in all the world and also in Morocco, glyphosate and paracot. This map shows the, the area of uh, the soil that we are, we are sampled. To establish this study, we have adopted the method of basal respiration in the laboratory. All soil were sterilized by autoclaving. 100 gram of soil we added in hermetic soil an hermetic glass, one of, the, of uh, one liter inoculated with two ml of inoculum of each strain at 1.5 times to 10 to, to 8. For each soil and each strain, two treatments were adopted. And one for glyphosate at the concentration 1.8 gram per liter, and the second one for paraquat, one uh, gram per liter. And one without two treatments with the uh, uh, without treatment adopted as a control. 
The glyphosate and paracot biodegradation in different soil type was evaluated by carbon dioxide evolution method described by Ferrin and Botton in 1991. And the rise of carbon dioxide was achieved at the, the day number two, four, eight, 16, and 24, and uh, 32. After, of course, the application of uh, the two pesticide glyphosate and paracos. As a result, firstly, this slide presents the physical, physical chemical parameters of the reused soils. Soil texture analysis shows the significant differences when comparing the four soil with each other. The dominance of clay was observed in verti soil by 40, 30, 1, 35%. Calcium and zinc soil with 50, uh, 55%. Will, uh, will fertilizing soil were reached in sand by uh, 85 and isoomic soil with reached by slides with uh, 46%. Moreover, Dirty soil and uh, calcium and soil were the richness reached in clay, with fresiatic soil contained the lowest proportion of clay by 6.95%. Moreover, calcium and soils had, uh, had high calcium, and, uh, cal calcium contents by 44.75 uh, milli equivalents for one, 100 gram of soil. And dirty soil had a high level of organic, organic matter by 5.8%. And the calcium was the most dominant element in all the soils with high content in calcium and soil with 44.75 milli equivalents for 100 gram of soil. Moving now to the results of the experiment, this slide show a carbon dioxide evolution from uh, four soil type with glyphosate inoculated by Pontoia agglomerans, rhizobacteria, rhizobium neopotum, rhizobium radiobacter, and rhizobium tibeticum. Significant difference for the four soil tested in this study during the experiment time and the four older treatments, the total respiration increased at the first four days. Total respiration was minimum in which the amount of carbon dioxide ranged from 46 to 114 for vertisol and from 46 to 151 for calcium and zinc and from 46 to 61 for uh, fersialytic and the last one from 46 to 126 for isoemic soil respectively also. From uh, the third day, for day, an important increase was observed. The quantity of carbon dioxide realized was doubled, and the continued with the increase until the last day of experimentation, which proves bacterial activity. As the graphic show, isoomic soil demonstrated high carbon dioxide production, while the fertilizing soil demonstrated low carbon dioxide production. This slide shows the carbon dioxide evolution for four soil types with paraquat, inoculated with paraquat. A significant difference for the four soil tested as the glyphosate results. During the experimentation time and all for all the treatment, the total respiration increased. The results indicate that the application of glyphosate and paracuat simulated soil microbial activity to cells and suggest that glyphosate and paracuat was the direct source of increased microbial activity. According to our host studies in 20, 2003, in the study, they have shown that the soil with high microbial activity promote the rapid glyphosate mineralization as well. According to the literature, paraquat is strongly absorbed by soil particles, particularly in clay soil. According to Amanda uh, study, strength tends our results for uh, soil rich in clay, the amount of dioxide of uh, carbon dioxide realized was low compared to the other soil. And glyphosate is degraded very rapidly in soil surface between zero and uh, and 20 centimeter, which is rich in clay and organic matter content. Then in the deep of uh, uh, to, uh, between 20 and 35 uh, centimeter, which is poor in clay. 
Also, when soil is rich in organic matter content and poor in nutrients, uh, in nutrient elements, it has glyphosate sor absorption and facilitate its degraded, reducing the risk of pesticide, despite its uh, absorbed on soil components. These results correlate positively with our results that show that important carbon dioxide production was observed in vertisol and in, in, uh, in, uh, in calcium magnesium soil, which are uh, rich in organic matter. Finally, the, to conclude, the data uh, confirm that uh, soil parameters such as organic matter, content clay, uh, content uh, in clay, soil texture influence the biodegradation of glyphosate and paraquat, and also soil parameters are a key factor of pesticide availability for mitochondrial organisms. And thank you so much for your attention. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the very interesting presentation, especially on this very interesting topic of glyphosate and paraquat, very important okay. herbicides, as we know. Um, I'm sure that there will be some question for you at the end of the session, so please stay with us. Okay. Um, actually, I don't know if we could uh, find um, the connection with our missing final presentation from our colleague from Nigeria. Um, is Mr. Anthony Ozoemenan Mutsoma with us now? Um, um, I don't see any signal. Are you here, Anthony? Um, apparently not. So, um, I would suggest that then at this stage that we move on to the question and answers. As I said before, um, um, we will um, open the floor for questions over the chat uh, to the three presenters that have been presenting to us their work in this uh, final block of this session. Um, so um, I will read the questions, but if you want to take also the floor and put questions uh, directly to the presenters, you are welcome. You can raise your hand and we will try to give you the, 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 the floor for putting your question uh, directly. Uh, for the moment, let me go through the chat. Uh, I see uh, a question for Joanna. I, I, is it possible to replicate your study in legumes, tree species? Joanna, mm -hmm. you are with us? Yes. Um, yes, it is poss possible, um, but we have to be sure it could not late. It could not late. Um, um, well, sorry, uh, I'm going to answer the question in Spanish because for in silly. Um, bueno, voy a repetir. Es posible. Eh, si es posible hacer los ensayos, unas pruebas en especies arbóreas que sean leguminosas, pero esto no nos asegura de que realmente vayan a nodular. Por eso es importante de que se hagan estas pruebas. Entonces, eh, no nos asegura de que nodulen, pero sí podría en las pruebas verse algún efecto como bacterias promotoras de crecimiento. Entonces, este, todo dependería de, de qué, a qué especies puede, puede este, promover el crecimiento. Y en realidad sí es posible. Gracias. Thanks. I hope that Ivete Makia is, is fluent in Spanish. Um, I hope so. Uh, anyway, uh, let's move on to the next question for Christina. Did you conduct metabolomic analysis to know the extent of support from plant rhizospheres since microbial community structure in your case was highly cultivar dependent? Quite a challenging Thanks question. Please go yeah. ahead. No, we did not. We didn't do metabolomics. We just uh, analyzed the the diversity of the 16S RNA. So yeah, taxonomic diversity. But it would be really interesting. I guess that's the next step. Yeah, once we demonstrate that there is something happening in the rhizosphere, then uh, the next step is to maybe kind of try to tease apart the mechanisms and exactly what's going on there. OK, thanks a lot. And now one for you, Mohamed. Uh, did you test different strains or just those for different bacterial species? 
No, just for this for uh, bacteria because uh, we have a, a small bank in our laboratory. We tested different kind of bacteria, and this four bacteria is uh, bacteria able to fix nitrogen, uh, atmospheric nitrogen. For this, we decide to to, to test it, this bacteria if they able to to degrade this kind two kind of pesticide. And we have another work that we tested the uh, different bacteria that's uh, solubilized phosphate solubilizing bacteria. And uh, we tested the, the effect of this species, uh, two pieces side in the, in the in this kind of uh, mechanisms. And also we have another work uh, of uh, effect of these two pieces in germination. And uh, also we have a part of uh, isolation of new bacteria from uh, uh, and with the, from a soil without uh, any historic with PC side and uh, or contact uh, previously with PC side. Okay, and Christina, one for you. Did you check the root exudates, which might send signal to the rhizosphere organism near strawberry plants? We didn't analyze the exudates. We just uh, sampled the soil, the rhizosphere soil, at the end of the experiment. Um, and we did that with uh, dry seeding. So we, we sampled the roots and we got, got rid of most of the soil. And then we just selected the soil that was immediately around the roots by seeding and shaking the roots really, you know, really well. Um, but we didn't collect the rhizosphere, uh, sorry, the exudates. In a, in a second study that we did, we analyzed the endophytes as well. And that's something that we're working on analyzing right now. Um, but we didn't collect exudates. Okay, thanks a lot. And another one for you, Mohamed. You used those four strains because they were most abundant, important, relevant in your country, or why did you do that? No, no, but uh, I told you that we have a, a bunk, a small bunk in our laboratory. We have a different kind of, of bacteria, that's uh, bacteria able to degrade the chemical of a different kind of chemical, the bacteria that's able to solubilize in phosphate, uh, that's bacteria that's uh, able to fix nit uh, atmospheric nitrogen. And we decide to, to, to assess uh, the different kind of this uh, bacteria with the pesticide and to show the if they're uh, this uh, uh, bacteria able to, to do it uh, two different way fix nitrogen or solubilize phosphate and uh, this, uh, the other side uh, we degrade the uh, uh, PC side. Okay. And what next? Here I see many other questions. We said a lot of compliments for all of you, of course. Uh, Joanna, do you believe that rhizobium species can work together with antagonistic strains? Yes, it's possible. Um, um, question in Spanish, uh, because for me is yeah, Google, maybe um, <laughs> I'm not that good in Spanish, but uh, maybe you can answer in Spanish. And then uh, I even so I'm not sure that Miriam understands Spanish, but uh, uh, let's see. You want to is answer in Spanish or maybe you can answer in writing in English or later on what you think. Si es posible eh, realizar los risobio sean eh, buenos para trabajar frente a bacteria, o bacterias, hongos, fitopatógenos, ¿no? Pero eh, hay que también probar esta, estos risobium. Eh, generalmente los risobium tienen el efecto más a nivel de sistémico, de una resistencia eh, inducida. Entonces, este, en las plantas, como estos nodulan, las bacterias nodulan, y la planta, digamos, se infecta con algún hongo, Estas pueden hacerle frente a este hongo. Entonces, sí, claro que es posible. Los rizobium tienen mucho potencial, no solamente como fijador de nitrógeno, sino también justamente como, eh, como antagonistas frente a hongos fitopatógenos. Okay, I, I could get the answer, but maybe you want to translate, Cristina. Yeah, I was going to say uh, <laughs> that apparently, so rizobium, Johanna, tell me if I'm right. But uh, so rhizobium can have a, an effect of inducing systemic resistance in the plant. So not fighting the pathogen directly, but more like enhancing the health of the plant by yeah, improving resistance of the plant. Okay, I think it was a good translation. Thanks a lot <laughs> <laughs> for the teamwork. 
And I have now in front a very complex and quite wide ranging question from Monica Tata. I don't know if she's online, but um, I think uh, such a deep question will need an entire conference probably. But uh, nevertheless, uh, if you want to take the floor and maybe explain a little bit your thinking, maybe it would be helpful. I don't know if you want to speak yourself. Otherwise, I would maybe first address the questions directly to, um, to, to Christina. There is a question here. Christina, here are a few questions. How did you determine whether the strawberry cultivars are only different in disease resistance? Would the soil rhizosphere be affected by other factors from the plant per se? The second question, you mentioned that rhizosphere could be used as selective traits, but how is it that different by just selecting resistance cultivars? Third question, how was the beneficial and beneficial bacteria determined? And fourth, the applicability of all uh, to, all, uh, to, an, to another's crops. Uh, quite a lot of for you, Christina. So I don't know if yeah, you that's a lot. <laughs> if it's all now or maybe in writing later on, but please go ahead. I can try and answer most of them. Um, so the cultivars were actually different in other things besides the resistance. So they, they had different yields, different fruit quality, lots of different traits were different. So it is possible that those traits also have an effect on the rhizosphere, right? Like bigger plants produce more exudates, for example, right? They have different nutrient uptake efficiencies, so forth. Um, but we specifically looked at resistance and we include a lot of cultivars to kind of increase the power of our analysis. And we did see differences between different resistant groups. And uh, that kind of went together with the presence of uh, specific beneficial microbes that we think might be involved in the resistance. Now, obviously that needs to be accompanied with more specific tests to kind of uh, keep uh, testing these, these hypotheses. But we think it's a really good start. And then in terms of beneficial uh, microorganisms, we use the literature and there is literature already that show that certain bacteria are um, have either show to promote the growth of plants or to be fungal antagonists. So to directly um, uh, inhibit the activity of uh, soil borne fungi. So that's that's how we we kind of selected that subgroup of beneficial microorganisms by using the literature and what has been shown in other studies. Okay, that's quite comprehensive. I really would like to hear from Monica Tata um, her question. Would you not like to take the floor and explain us a little bit more? Because I'm not familiar with the Satish Kuma trilogy soil. So, but I'm very interested. So if you want to take the floor, you, you can. I mean, uh, I don't know how to do that, but um, I'm more than happy to give you the floor uh, and listen to you. Uh, we have still a few minutes left. Um, I don't know how to do this, but uh, I, maybe the technicians can help me. Yes, they have unmuted me. Oh, perfect. And please tell us. Okay, so my question was the, the informal culture of the farmers before pharmaceutical industry actually got involved in the produce of so in the production of food as an industrial measure, the farmers were very knowledgeable. So they they actually were in the, fir the first years of agriculture, the farmers were mimicking nature in every sense of the word because they had no other option. They were replicating the methods. And there we didn't see, or there is no record in validated science of the pests and so much of what is then afterwards a result of the industry trying to, let's use it, marketing the benefits of pesticides and chemicals in the soil. So in the last decades after the industrial revolution, and in order to accommodate the waste from the oil production and the warfare, we introduced the big machineries and all the chemicals in agriculture. So how is it that today we are now trying to sell the idea again that nature creates within its cycles pests and diseases and therefore we need the contribution of an industry that actually creates more troubles than produces the solution? That was my question. Was I able to explain it? 
Absolutely, yes, for me at least. Uh, I, I think it would deserve an entire conference, but uh, I, I, I really want to benefit from the last minutes we have to give the floor to the presenters if they have any opinion on what you just said, please. Uh, any of you, Joanna, Christina, or, or, or any, or Mohamed, or, or also the other that have been presenting before. The floor is open, please. Any views? That was a very loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> and I do think that a lot of the problems that we're seeing in agriculture, and there's evidence, they are caused by the practices that we're using, and including, you know, the, the diseases, pollution, etc. So we need to kind of work ourselves our way back and, uh, and learn from the natural processes that occur in soils and how they could help us produce more sustainably. I totally agree with the comment, yes. And there's a lot of uh, traditional knowledge that uh, needs to be used and taken advantage of for these, these approaches. Okay, thanks a lot. And I hope that Monica is happy with the very first attempt to address her points because I repeat, these are very far reaching considerations and I hope they will be taken up by, by FAO and others in a more broader discussion. Um, any other points that you would like to discuss? Uh, I, I, I'm still looking if our colleague from Nigeria eventually could manage to connect uh, Anthony Uzememan Utsoma, because I really feel it's a shame if he cannot present his work. Um, unfortunately, that's the problem when you do this type of meetings uh, remotely. Um, I, we still have some minutes that he could use, but otherwise the floor is open. If anybody else wants to take the floor or present any questions to the to the to the uh, people who have been presenting their work, mm, doesn't seem so. So uh, everybody seems very satisfied of what we have done in this session. I hope um, personally I am. So it was very interesting. And um, I hope that also th you will benefit from the fact that uh, the presentations will be put online so that you can go back to the, what was presented. Um, I suspect that there will be also proceedings, hopefully from this uh, conference and from this symposium. So uh, I would leave now the floor maybe for the very final considerations if any colleague from FAO or from the organizing committee wants to say anything concerning the way forward after the closing of the session, please take the floor. Otherwise, from my side, I would be more than happy to close the session and wish you uh, a good, I don't know, day, evening, night, whatever is the time in your place. Um, Christina or Bofe? Carolina, sorry, not Christina. Anything from the side of FAO? Uh, no, Luca, we, uh, thank you.